Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let me express my appreciation for being asked to do one of these presentations in this series of lectures at the Cleveland Clinic. If I may just take you back through my own clinical experience to a time when I was at another institution here in Cleveland and was presented with this situation at a mortality morbidity conference with our pathologist. Now, this was a patient who had died with end-stage liver disease, whose autopsy liver showed this picture with fully established cirrhosis. And as you see from the arrow, a small hepatocellular cancer that had been undiagnosed prior to the patient's demise, but in which the liver had stained extremely strongly with Pearl's Prussian blue stain, as you can see in the lower picture. This was the prototypic picture of hemochromatosis resulting in liver disease and ultimately liver failure in which the microscopy of the liver also stained with Prussian blue, stained for iron, showed this heavy deposition of these blue granules in virtually every hepatocyte of this liver. This was an example, an extreme example, of an individual with this inherited condition known as hemochromatosis, which turns out to be the commonest Mendelian genetic disease affecting humans. The clinical condition had been described back in the 19th century by some of the great clinicians of Europe in which a combination of skin pigmentation, cirrhosis and diabetes formed the clinical triad of heredity hemochromatosis that had progressed to the stage of end organ damage as typified by liver disease and diabetes mellitus. The other constellation of symptoms and signs have expanded this syndrome, and our understanding today is an even more diverse presentation of this common inherited condition. The early descriptions of bronze diabetes came from the clinicians of Europe, Trousseau, von Recklinghausen, and later in a classic monograph by John Sheldon in the United Kingdom, virtually described everything we know from the clinical point of view about this condition. But they had little understanding of the mechanism of this condition. And I am going to spend the first part of my talk today going into the background to illustrate to you how clinical medicine can provide us with insights into basic pathophysiology with far broader consequences than perhaps had been realized back in this era of time. The major breakthrough in our understanding came with the techniques of molecular biology, with a description by Feder and his colleagues published in Nature in 1996, in which the defect in the single gene, the HFE gene, was first described. It turns out that this gene codes for a protein, a transmembrane protein, as shown in this diagram, which resembled MHC class I antigens to a remarkable degree. It also turned out that the vast majority of individuals with hereditary hemochromatosis had a single point mutation, shown here as the C282Y mutation, which replaced a single amino acid in the protein coded for this gene and turned out to be the most significant mutation responsible for over 90% of cases of inherited hemochromatosis. How did this gene originate? Well, interestingly, now going back in population studies, it was apparent that this was a Celtic gene, the mutation of which was first noted in the Celts who had migrated 
to different parts of Europe, shown on this map here, originating two millennia plus ago, and migrating throughout Europe, migrating ultimately to the United States and to Australia. And you can see here in Central Europe, where the Celts originated, that they moved to the British Isles, they moved down into the Iberian Peninsula, they moved across into Turkey, which is called Galatia on this map, and therefore this gene really went with the population migration of Celts. And the Celts multiplied very fruitfully, as we all know. So now we have a gene mutation which is as prevalent as one in 150 of the population amongst Caucasian populations, particularly from Northern Europe, who are now populating the United States of America, Canada, Australia, and of course, where the gene originated, back in Europe. So coming back to what these clinicians described in the late 1900s, it turns out that virtually 90% plus of these cases were related to the HFE gene mutation that I showed you on the previous slide. Subsequently, we realized that the clinical syndrome that this gene accounted for, namely hereditary hemochromatosis, could often be mimicked in other acquired conditions, shown here as acquired hemochromatosis or secondary iron overload, and a variety of other miscellaneous iron overload states that have been described. I'm going to concentrate on this morning's lecture on the first two categories here, expanding into acquired hemochromatosis to illustrate for you some of the clinical dilemmas that we are presented with in our daily clinical practices. Hereditary hemochromatosis, as I described earlier, and the vast majority are type 1 on this list, were associated with the mutation of the HFE gene. More than 90% of all hereditary hemochromatosis can be accounted for by this mutation. We now have a number of other types that have been described, types 2, 3, and 4, in which other iron regulatory genes have been implicated. And these have all been discovered subsequent to the discovery in 1996 of the HFE gene. And the HFE gene we all possess is the mutation that accounts for 90% of these disease conditions. The other genes that have been described, hemojuvalin, hepcidin, transferrin receptor 2, and ferroportin turn out to be genes that regulate, that code for regulatory proteins that play a role in the overall regulation of iron metabolism in all of us. And I'm going to describe in a little more detail what the regulation of iron metabolism is in order for you to understand the importance of these genes. To complete the list, let me show you the causes of secondary iron overload only some of which I'll be able to go into this morning. Iron loading anemias, with or without blood transfusion, a very important category here. And these are associated and seen for the most part by the hematologists. Dietary iron overload is a rare situation, but has been described in individuals who have been prescribed iron or have chosen to take over-the-counter iron, which is freely available here in the United States, in quantities that are excessive and can lead to pathologic accumulation of iron in the body. And finally, a group of chronic liver diseases that we all see frequently. And I'm going to spend a little more time later on describing some of the dilemmas that arise in these conditions as to the role of iron in the pathogenesis of the severity and progression of these diseases. I have to come back to describe normal iron balance for you because the concept that I want to convey here to you is that for the most part, on a regular American diet, we are well provided for with iron. And this is without any extra supplementation in the way of any vitamin or 
mineral supplements, but this is just on our diet, particularly if we are meat eaters. We ingest 10 to 20 milligrams per day of iron. But we only absorb from our intestine 1 to 2 milligrams per day, which is all that's required to replace losses that we have. From the intestine, the skin, and the urine of only 1 to 2 milligrams per day. Women, during the reproductive period of life, lose iron by physiologic blood loss at the menstrual cycle, so that adds a little more to the woman's loss and therefore to the woman's requirements. But again, she's usually well provided for by the normal dietary intake available in most of our diets. I think the important thing to realize from that previous slide is that what there must be in the way of regulation is some mechanism that excludes the vast majority of dietary iron that we take and that we don't absorb as part of our physiologic regulation. And that physiologic regulation is built into the overall distribution of iron that we require for our physiologic needs. On the right side of this slide, you see the GI tract, which is the root of ingress of iron for most of us. The small amount of iron of 1 to 2 milligrams per day is absorbed from the GI tract and is then bound to that small green compartment in the middle, transferrin, which is really the grand central station for all the iron that comes into the body. Transferrin is the transporter protein that takes iron around the body and distributes it to the sites of utilization shown by the red circles, mainly to make red blood cells, which are in a constant process of turnover, to replace myoglobin, the heme in myoglobin, which is also under turnover, and in a variety of heme enzymes, which are vitally important for our physiologic processes in all tissues, in particular the liver. The blue compartments here are sites of iron storage, which under physiologic normal situation are distributed between the liver, the hepatocytes, and the monocyte macrophage system, namely our reticular endothelial system. Why do we need these storage sites? Well, they're there to provide backup for the physiologic requirement for replacement of iron should there be an emergency need, such as blood loss, for example. The blue compartment is there as the physiologic storage site, iron being stored as ferritin in those situations. You see that this is in a dynamic state of equilibrium. That transferrin iron in the middle, in the plasma, is being turned over 10 to 20 times per day. So iron is a constant state of flux. And the only iron that's required to replace loss from the GI tract is coming in from our dietary iron. Now, since the early part of this century, the understanding of this balance of iron has really reached a very sophisticated level. And this was a recent publication earlier this year in the New England Journal of Medicine from Fleming and Poinker that illustrates really what we now understand about iron turnover. And the reason I'm showing you this is because those inherited conditions I showed you earlier are nearly all related to an abnormality in some part of this cycle. Storage site in the liver, the hepatocyte on the left, where iron is stored as ferritin, and iron coming in from the enterocyte are being recycled around this system constantly to provide iron incorporated into heme in the erythroid cells or in heme in other sites of the body, as well as in myoglobin. On the top left, you see the duodenal enterocyte, which is the site of iron absorption from the intestine. And there you see the one to two milligrams per day coming in from our diet, being bound to transferrin, and transport it to those sites of utilization. You'll also notice an arrow on the left from the liver 
that points to a protein at the top called hepcidin. And hepcidin turns out to be the master protein in the control of this entire cycle. Because hepcidin is the regulator protein that suppresses iron absorption from the enterocyte, as you see on the top left. It suppresses iron release from the reticular endothelial cell on the top right. And it's that suppressive function of hepcidin that physiologically keeps out the 18 or so excessive amount, milligrams of excessive iron that we're taking in our dietary intake. I'll come back to hepcidin in a little more detail because this turns out to be the vitally important protein that is regulating our body iron cycling. And I'm taking you back to this list here to show you that hepcidin under type 2 here happens to be one of those proteins that also can have a mutation and are responsible for a condition known as juvenile hemochromatosis, which occurs in the young and mimics hereditary hemochromatosis almost down to the letter. You'll see other proteins there, hemojuvelin and transferrin receptor 2 and ferroportin. Well, how do they interact to provide the overall regulation of iron? And I show you this diagram now because this really in one picture basically describes the entire function and regulation of iron metabolism. And here we have the role of the liver, which is the only site for hepcidin synthesis. And there we have hepcidin in the middle of this diagram. But you'll see that hepcidin function is influenced on the left by the HFE protein, or the transferrin receptor 2 protein, or the hemojuvelin protein, all of which have receptor sites on the liver. Hepcidin is released into the circulation, and what does it do? How does it downregulate iron absorption and iron release? It does it by interacting with the protein ferroportin, shown on the right at the upper part of the diagram, which is responsible of, for iron release from the duodenal enterocyte. Ferroportin is responsible for iron release from the macrophage. And it's that ferroportin regulation which governs the amount of iron that can be absorbed from the intestine or released from the RE system that is the important thing in regulating our overall iron balance. How does hepcidin do it? It interacts with ferroportin to degrade it. In other words, the combination of hepcidin bound to ferroportin is susceptible to degradation and thereby reduces the function of ferroportin. Now clearly a mutation in hepcidin that failed to do that or a diminished amount of hepcidin because of liver disease or because of interaction with the proteins in the liver you see on the left can result in defective function of hepcidin. And it turns out the defective fun function of hepcidin is the fund fundamental basis for iron overload. So what is iron overload? How do we define it? And how does, how does hepcidin bring about that iron overload? Well, here it is as a liver-produced 25-amino acid peptide, quite a small protein, that determines the amount of iron absorbed from the intestine. It influences the release of iron from storage sites. And therefore, its cellular targets are the enterocyte in the intestine, the RE macrophage, and of course, the hepatocyte itself. Well, keeping this in mind, what are the physiologic actions? It plays the major role in sensing body iron status and modulates the ferroportin-mediated release of iron. It decreases the functional activity of ferroportin and thereby it decreases iron transport out of the enterocyte and macrophage. Now on the bottom line on this, you can now regard hepcidin that's synthesized by the liver as the principal hormone of iron regulation, as opposed to what we were thinking in 1996 when we thought that the HFE protein was the culprit here. It turns out to be a secondary culprit. It's the hepcidin 
that plays the major role in the accumulation of iron to an excessive degree. So the molecular pathogenesis of iron overload, as we understand it in 2012, is that there is deficient availability of hepcidin, either because of diminished synthesis, for example, by liver disease, or by diminished function that's related to the mutation of the HFE gene and the other regulatory genes that leads to upregulated ferroportin function by the failure of hepcidin to bind and inactivate ferroportin. Consequentially from this, let's go back to this cartoon and see what the effects are on this overall distribution of iron in the body. And here we have the same color scheme, the blue being the storage sites. And what you see now is that the excessive absorption of iron from the intestine, because of this failure of hepcidin to regulate iron absorption, leads to a buildup of storage iron. And this is our safety valve for iron that comes in that we can't utilize by the red sites, the sites of utilization. Which organ? takes the brunt of this, here you see it's the liver. The liver's got a tremendous capacity for storing iron. And this will be reflected in a liver biopsy like this, which I happen to have done on a 69-year-old lady with homozygous hemochromatosis, who showed the excessive distribution of iron here, again by the blue staining representing ferritin hemosiderin, hemosiderin being the degradation product, but you'll notice that there are areas of the liver that don't show as much iron deposition as others. It's mostly in this peri, uh, perivenous area, as you can see here, or the pericentral area, I should say, where most of that iron is being stored. This lady has no liver disease. She has excessive iron in her liver, the liver being the reservoir for this iron deposition that doesn't seem to produce disease. Well, what happens if this is undiagnosed and progresses further to the condition of marked iron excess? And here you see the same cartoon. And here you see the, the storage in the liver at the bottom here has now built up to marked iron excess. We see a little increase in the monocyte macrophage system, and we also see spillage of iron into other parenchymal cells such as muscle and pancreas and so forth. Failure to diagnose at this stage leads to massive iron overload. And now you can see this enormous reservoir of iron in the liver here. The consequences of which are far less benign than I showed you earlier. Because now we have this tremendous accumulation of hemosiderin in hepatocytes, virtually every liver cell here showing hemosiderin, the granules, but also Kupfer cells, the RE cells, also showing it on this picture that also indicate the flow over into the RE system as well. The consequence of this is, unfortunately, the development of cirrhosis. And this is what we would ideally like to prevent. And here you see the microscopy of a liver with cirrhosis showing broad bands of fibrous tissue breaking up the normal architecture of the liver with each of these regenerative nodules massively overloaded with iron in the form of hemosiderin. So clearly this iron, based upon these data, has been associated with the development of end-stage liver disease. So we want to summarize the pathogenetic mechanisms for hemochrom hereditary hemochromatosis, particularly the HFE variety. Of course, there has to be the gene abnormality in the first place. It turns out the gene frequency in the white population, both here in the United States and in Europe, is 5% of the population. One in 20 have the mutation for the HFE gene on one or other of their pair of chromosomes. One in 150 to 250 have them on both chromosomes. They, they are homozygous for the gene abnormality and therefore likely to show some manifestations of iron overload, but not invariably. The gene location is on chromosome 6, and the mutation we're talking about 
is the homozygous 282-282 mutation of that single substitution that I showed you on an early diagram. That mutation leads to the pathophysiologic development of inappropriate iron absorption from our replete diet, leading to two to four milligrams instead of one milligram of iron being absorbed, leading to the net accumulation of about 1,000 milligrams per year. It's a slow process. It's only two to four times the normal absorption. But over the course of time, it's potentially pathogenic in terms of disordered structure and function. We know that iron toxicity and organelle toxicity, based upon reactive oxygen species and free radical generation, correlate the iron level to the degree of fibrosis and therefore to cirrhosis that are observed in some individuals. And it's that iron toxicity that is responsible for the development of iron overload disease. Not just liver disease, but diabetes, cardiac disease, joint disease, skin pigmentation that I showed you on the classical picture described by the older clinicians. So here we have the summary of what the gene mutations do. Abnormal intestinal epithelial protein, the HFE protein, leading to increased iron absorption and ultimately iron-induced toxic liver injury and fibrogenesis. In terms of the age at which this occurs, because it's only two to four milligrams excessive absorption today, per day, this is a slowly developing genetic disease that doesn't manifest until the adult years. We're born with a genetic predisposition that doesn't have iron overload at birth, leads to early iron overload, maybe up to the age of 20 or thereabout, accumulating two to five grams a day, as opposed to those blue areas which add up in normal individuals of only about a gram total. So this is two to five times by the age of 20. Undiagnosed, moderate iron overload, age 20 to 40. And only heavy iron overload in excess of 10 grams or 10 times the normal by the age of 40 in the male and perhaps later in the female because of physiologic blood loss. Disease results in some individuals, but not all. And the four stages of the disorder, the ultimately developing disease, it's now recognized that only 10 to 15% of those individuals, homozygous for the 282Y mutation, actually develop clinical disease. And as a consequence of this, Jennifer Cuthbert here very nicely illustrated that the pattern of disease in hereditary hemochromatosis, the classic picture being the middle part of this diagram, really relates to the accumulation of iron in the liver shown on the left hand uh, and vertical axis that by the age of 40 has built up to toxic levels in the individuals who present with the classical presentation. There are variants of this. Juvenile onset, early onset on the left, due to the hemojuvelin or hepcidin mutation, can lead to the early onset of the same picture. And then we have some individuals who seem to be resistant to this, shown as late onset development. So it's these variant clinical pictures. In fact, some individuals who never develop iron overload. And this is one of the mysteries of how these mutations actually bring about their effect. At this point, I'm going to stop, and in the next part of my presentation, I'm going to be talking about how we deal with the diagnosis of these conditions.